The 2000s gave us Save the Last Dance. When the movie came out, it was a popular teen dance film, but how has it held up? While there's still plenty to love in Save the Last Dance, adults watching it might notice some details that younger audiences don't. Save the Last Dance has a happy ending, but it's hard to believe that it's a hopeful story about love and following your dreams from the opening of the film. The first few minutes are pretty depressing, especially for a teen movie. In the opening scenes, we see Sarah taking the train to live with her dad in Chicago. Not only did she fail to get into the school of her dreams, but her mother has also died in a tragic car accident. That's a lot to unpack at the start of a movie, especially when the film isn't supposed to be a tearjerker. While it's meant to be uplifting and empowering, it's hard to shake off the sadness and the desperation of that opening. It's a bleak start to the film, particularly one that was released in the 2000s, which was a decade of delightfully cheesy teen movies. Sarah is a great dancer, but is she really Juilliard material? It's one of the top schools for the arts. Students who are accepted to the institution are at the top of their game. The school's famous alumni include Viola Davis, Nina Simone, Robin Williams, and Yo-Yo Ma. Its dance program is incredibly competitive, accepting only 24 students each year. With applications coming in from all over the world, that means this particular character's chances of acceptance are pretty minuscule. Sarah insists that her mom be at her audition, even though she's having a busy day at work. Mom, this is the hardest, most important day of my life. You have to be there. You promise. Auditions can be nerve-wracking, sure, but how is Sarah supposed to survive in a cutthroat environment if she can't handle one without her mom being there? How will she manage performances if someone isn't there to hold her hand? If she needs that level of emotional support in order to get on stage, a performance career might not be the best fit for her and may only lead to future anxiety. After Sarah's mother dies, she's forced to live with her estranged father in a home that looks like it's falling apart. Sarah's dad doesn't even get her a proper bed and instead has her sleep on a sofa bed from the 80s. He doesn't keep nutritious food in the house for her, instead showing her only a freezer full of TV dinners. Sarah immediately dismisses the idea of eating those meals, saying that her mom wouldn't let her eat that kind of food. I had a big lunch. While TV dinners aren't the worst thing you can eat, Sarah's mom had the right idea. Fresh foods have a lot more nutritional value than frozen foods. The fact that her dad thinks she can live off frozen food is pretty ridiculous and a clear sign that he needs to brush up on his parenting skills. Sarah goes through some pretty traumatic experiences. She loses her dream of attending Juilliard. She experiences a massive upheaval in her life by having to move to a new city and attend a new school. She also feels like her mother's death is her fault. Just one of those would be enough to significantly stress out a person, so why isn't Sarah in therapy? At the very least, she should be in grief counseling to cope with her mom's death. It's clear that she harbors a lot of guilt over her mother's passing, and being separated from her friends, she isn't getting much emotional support. Sarah is clearly depressed. She isolates herself and punishes herself by quitting dance, something that she loves to do. Both are signs that she's not handling things well and needs some help. Sarah doesn't seem to be phased by the demographic shift she experiences when she starts at her new school in Chicago. Strangely though, while there isn't much hostility between the white kids and the black kids in the school, they don't really mingle much either. Instead, it seems that the white kids more or less stick to themselves. Seeing this kind of racial segregation in a movie that takes place in the 2000s is unnerving, though it might not actually be too far off the mark. While Chicago is one of the most racially diverse cities in the United States, it's also one of the most segregated. Different groups largely stick to their own neighborhoods across the city and, it seems, to their own lunch tables. When Sarah gets a fake ID so she can dance with her new friends at the nightclub steps, she's horrified to find out that the picture on her ID is someone who doesn't conform to her aesthetic standards. Sarah protests that the young woman is fat and ugly, which is a pretty gross judgment call. Chanel, she's ugly. The language is especially harsh coming from the film's main character, who we're supposed to be rooting for. Had it come from the mouth of one of her friends, it would have maybe been more understandable, but it's clear that Sarah doesn't think that body shaming is a big deal and that putting someone down is totally acceptable behavior. Thankfully, the body positivity movement has been on the rise since Save the Last Dance came out in 2001. Before Sarah's first trip to Steps, she meets Chenille at her house. Sarah asks if she's dressed okay, and Chenille assures her that she looks fine before they head out to the club. Outside the club, Sarah asks again if she's dressed appropriately for a night out. 
At this point, Chenille borrows someone's car keys and gives Sarah a backseat makeover. It seems like this would have been a lot easier to do back at the house, but okay, Chenille do it your way. Chenille changes up Sarah's hair, has her remove her shirt and just wear a tank top and, here's the gross part, takes out her hoop earrings and has Sarah put them in her own ears. This is a really good way to get an ear infection. It would have been one thing if Sarah had borrowed earrings back at the house where she could have disinfected them with alcohol first, but sharing unsanitized earrings is not something anyone should ever do. Fans of Save the Last Dance, take note. Sarah assumes that the baby Chenille's grandmother carries is Chenille's. While the baby is, in fact, Chenille's son, it kind of makes you wonder if Sarah would have jumped to the same conclusion if Chenille were white. Is he, he yours? He sure ain't Mama Dean's. Just a few scenes later, she asks Derek if he has any kids, which seems to support the theory that Sarah thinks black people are more likely to be single teen parents. Her friend from her hometown also assumes that her new neighborhood is in the ghetto and that there are regular shootings. And then there's this. I, I met this guy and he's really cool. They got white guys at your school? It never occurs to Sarah's friend that she could date outside her race. Even Chenille says that her brother Derek is one of the few decent men that we have left after jail, drugs, and drive-by, therefore dismissing the vast majority of men in the black community. On top of all that, the black characters in the film are portrayed as skilled dancers who are into hip-hop. Save the Last Dance's stereotypes are so overdone that when the film was released, it was panned by critics for its outdated cliches. Sarah is the primary white character, and in Save the Last Dance, that means she comes with her own bundle of cliches. She's portrayed as a straight-laced girl who is supposed to be a clear contrast to Chenille. While Chenille's primary purpose is to serve as a cautionary tale about the difficulties of teen pregnancy, Sarah's ambitions are set on her studies and getting into a good college. And things get weird the first time Sarah goes to Steps. As she hits the dance floor, she clearly has trouble dancing to hip-hop. Even with years of dance training under her belt, she's completely unable to feel the beat. Bizarrely, she seems to struggle with even basic dance moves that are effortless for other characters in the film. While people who are rejected from Juilliard can re-audition up to two times, it's pretty unlikely that Sarah would have gotten a second chance so late in the year, or that she would have gotten a verbal confirmation of acceptance on the spot. I can't say this on the record yet, but welcome to Juilliard. Needless to say that with only 24 open spaces available in the program, things get pretty competitive. Auditions are scheduled well in advance, so the odds of Sarah being granted a second one so late in the audition season are pretty slim. That doesn't even touch on how she managed to get back in top dancing shape and to perfect her technique enough to be admitted in just one month. In order to even apply to Juilliard, prospective students must be training for at least 10 hours per week, something Sarah clearly hadn't been doing until just a few weeks before her second audition. Her dramatic second try makes for an empowering cinematic moment, but it's one that would likely have been difficult to pull off in real life. It's no doubt a very dramatic moment during Sarah's audition when Derek rushes into the auditorium to motivate her after she makes a mistake in her dance routine, but it's also pretty unprofessional. All it shows to the audition committee is that Sarah, who is already on her second audition, needs a pep talk to perform. You can do it. It's how you were born to do it. To make things even worse, Derek jumps back onto the stage to hug her after she successfully completes her dance, telling the committee that they should let her in. It's far more likely that in a real audition, this kind of behavior would get a dancer rejected from a school rather than accepted on the spot. It seems pretty unlikely that a school with such a competitive program would grant admission to a student who not only messed up multiple auditions, but who also brings a dramatic boyfriend along with her. But hey. This is a movie, so instead of the committee warning Sarah about her unprofessional audition, she instead is admitted to Juilliard as soon as she finishes dancing. By the end of Save the Last Dance, Sarah and Derek are back together and happy. But how long can this relationship really last? It's clear that most of their friends and family don't really approve, which is the first strike against them. They're also from completely different backgrounds, and Sarah is clearly more sheltered and doesn't fully comprehend the troubles that people of color face in America. There's only one world, Chanel. That is what they teach you. We know different. To top it off, they're both super young and are about to head off to different colleges. 
Georgetown and Juilliard are a few hours apart, so while Sarah and Derek are both going to be on the East Coast, making this relationship work is still going to be a challenge. It doesn't help that they've already proven that they have communication issues and have even broken up once. Sorry, Sarah and Derek, but this relationship seems doomed. Throughout the film, we get pretty attached to two of the supporting characters, Malachi and Chenille. Since this is a romantic dance film, we kind of expect everyone to get a happy ending, but they don't. Malachi ends up injured and arrested, and he will presumably be sent back to juvie instead of completing high school. Given his persistent unwillingness to turn his life around, it's likely that he will never graduate. Chenille's future looks like it'll be tough, too, as she's a single teen mom. A big part of her support system, her brother, is about to disappear, with Derek moving away for college. It would have been nice if we could see her storyline end on a more optimistic note. Couldn't the movie show that she, too, has plans for college, was awarded a scholarship, or started a business? Unfortunately, it seems that only Sarah and Derek get happy endings as they merrily dance off into the credits. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more list videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.